Hey, y'all. My name is uh, Tiffany Keith. I am a pastor at First United Methodist Church in Colorado Springs, and I am preaching each week at Cowboy Church, which is 945 on Sunday mornings uh, here in the parking lot. So people sit in their cars and, and worship with us each week. I know we have a really just amazing preachers here, uh, Kent Ingram and Patty Walker and and I, we, we sit down often and just talk about the sermons that we're working on and, and help each other develop the sermons and work our way through them. And it is, it is one of our, it's one of my favorite parts of the week. I don't know about them, but so I, I thought, what if we just dropped a camera in the middle of us and invited you all into our conversation? So we're going to take a little bit, talk about the sermons that we're working on for this week and, and kind of have conversations with one another and invite you to, to join us in that. And here with us today is Patty and Ken. So Patty. Hi folks, I'm Patty Walker, and um, as you may know, First United Methodist Church is a multi-site congregation, and we planted a, a second campus of the church out in the Vanny Lewis Ranch area a little over a year ago that's called First United Methodist Church Prairie Campus, and I'm the pastor of that satellite campus, and we are doing drive-in services every Sunday at 10 a.m. And I'm Kent Ingram. I've been pastor here for almost 14 years, and unlike Patty and Tiffany, I don't preach to anybody on Sunday morning these days. They at least have cars that they get to speak to. I preach to an empty sanctuary. I preach the service that we televise uh, on uh, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, also on the Facebook page and on our website. And I just want to pick up on what Tiffany said. It was Fred Craddock who years ago talked about the need to invite people into the study. That So often pastors would prepare in the study and come out and deliver something to the congregation that was sort of a finished product. And he invited preachers to invite people into the study to the points where you're wrestling and thinking and talking about these important issues in the Bible. So that's literally what we're doing. We're inviting you into our study, into our minds, and into our preparation for the sermons for this coming week. So we hope you enjoy spending a little time in our minds, in our place, as we prepare. I want to open us with a word of prayer before we begin today. Let's pray. Loving God, you continue to speak to us, and we, the preachers, are blessed to be the people through whom you speak. We ask you to keep us sensitive to your spirit, open to your word, and let us be truthful, faithful, and courageous in what we say. We ask you to bless those who listen to us, that they might hear what you have for them to hear. Not that they might enjoy it, that they might be changed and transformed by it. Bless our conversation and our hearing. And in the midst of all of this, let us feel your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I am preaching out of Matthew 16. And the Jesus and the disciples went to Caesarea Philippi, and they start talking about, you know, but who, you know, who is Jesus? Who do the people say that I am? And, and finally, Peter says, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus, you know, says to him, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So as I'm as I'm reading the commentaries, and we're talking about Caesarea Philippi, and, and there's there's these images of um, it's a basically a pagan temple. It's a, a cave, right? So I, I, I'm picturing myself sitting in front of this cave, listening to Jesus talk, and it, and we're, we're sitting in front of a, a pagan temple. And, um, and I, read, I was listening to a couple of sermons this mm -hmm. week, and one of them talked about it. It would be kind of like, um, like an is Islamic rabbi going into a Christian church or um, you know, a Jewish person coming into a Christian church or you know, just a leader in, in one faith being in another one. So what I'm really wrestling through this week and not sure how to talk about is there's something that is really uncomfortable for me thinking about going into somebody else's church 
and saying the gates of hell will not prevail against who we are and i know the definition of hell and the original greek and in the hebrew can mean different things so it can mean hell but it can mean this separation from god or it can mean um just this i don't i don't know if there was another one in there but how would you wrestle through these words that talk about the gates of hell in the context of sitting next to another face sanctuary you know for me i think that to help define the gates of hell in such a way that that it's those are the things that all of those faiths confront that that it's not accusing the other of being the gates of hell but but together we confront these forces these realities that push back against the heart and the soul of our message and i think one of the unfortunate things of our time is that we tend to define those enemies of the church very politically and and in ways that sort of divide people up and i suspect that the gates of hell in our time and in our place really are far more subtle um things like consumerism and greed um and and the things that so many of us just take for granted and live out of in our time are perhaps the biggest dangers and threats to the message to the to the heart of the message what we have and the muslim message and the jewish message and other messages as well i don't know what you think betty well first i just i think it's really interesting that you picked up on that piece that of the context of where he was talking i've i've never thought about that or whatever so i just wanted to i think that's cool you know just about um i don't know if there's some kind of connection or or outreach that that he was being intentional about um i think kind of when you were talking about you know threats to the faith and that kind of thing i was thinking about um you know when you when jesus would talk about or you know when he would challenge and he was never he wasn't challenging other religions and what he would challenge were really kind of like his insider group of jewish folks and their hypocrisy or being legalistic or that kind of thing and so um yeah i just i don't as i think about that passage in the context we've talked about i don't think about it as in any way um as an affront to other religions yeah as you're talking i know what comes so in this text it says peter you are the rock on on you i will build my church and then in the in the next story looks at peter and says you're you're a stumbling block you know so there's both so i wonder there's something just saying that i wonder if in context you know that that they can't the disciples end up being the stumbling block not the pagan temple they're sitting in front of you know so and you know actually when you talk about that that makes me think about something that that for peter and i think for us too like we bounce back and forth between those right like that that we have these moments where we are a rock and hopefully a bearer of good news and hope and you know being a follower of christ and then you know the very next minute the next hour we're we're the stumbling block you know we're we're the ones that's in the way hindering god so it's that's our movement our journey what do you think the rock is i mean you know is it is it peter physically this human being is it the faith he carries is it his strength his willing to share his willing to be brave and out there i mean it i guess my question i don't have an answer for you but my question then becomes is whatever that rock is is that something we can be you know that stumbling block one minute can we be something that builds up the church or is that a human being that you know back there 2000 years ago that we can just put the responsibility sure on him 
Sure. I mean, in our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers, of course, put a lot of weight on the person of Peter. Then through him, you have the lineage, the, the ordinations, you know, that, that, that trace their way all the way back to Peter. And we, we as Methodists, in fact, um, do the same thing. You know, we, we, we latch on to the Anglican Church, which came out of the Catholic Church, and we trace our ordination all the way back to Peter. So there is some historical piece around that, but but I, I, I like the idea that, that maybe it is something something that he embodies, some, something that we can embody as well, that is the foundation of the church rather than an individual, you know, a, a person. So, yeah. I think for me he's, um, he's a rock because of his relationship with Jesus, which was just so, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, you know, the, the denials, the running away, and yet, you know, he just has, he does have so much passion and heart and commitment, um, and does love Jesus so much, um, but I think, I think the rock really is, you know, Jesus and him never giving up on him and always working with him, and, um, you know, him finally getting to this place where he can, you know, he can offer that as a gift to the world. Well, thank you both so much. <laughs> Tons of stuff for me to think about um, through this week and as I work on my sermon. So, Patty, I think you are next. <coughs> so I've been, I guess, the last six weeks or so doing um, a series in the book of Acts. And this week I'm going to be preaching from Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. So I won't, I won't read it all to you, but I'll, just, I'll give you a little recap of it. And it was interesting, as I was... Um, looking at this passage, I have to confess, I, I don't remember it at all. It's not, it's not in the lectionary, and um, I probably just skipped over it in, in the past. So, but I just find it, um, I find it funny. It's a funny story. Um, so this is this is during the first you know missionary journey of of Paul, and he's with he's with Barnaby, and they've gone to Lystra, and Paul does a healing there. And then after the healing, um, so he this is this is a pagan city. There's uh, there's not a Jewish synagogue there because usually you know Paul and Barnabas would go to a synagogue. Um, there's a small Jewish population there though, uh, but not a synagogue. So interestingly, when you brought up that pagan uh, area, so they it's it's primarily a pagan community. So they go, they do this healing, and the people are you know they're completely wowed by this. And, and they're all like, wow, like this is Zeus and Hermes. Mm. So they think that, that Paul is, is Hermes and Barnabas is Zeus. And so they're like, they're so excited. You know, they're, they're trying to fit this into, into their context, into their religious experience. So they figure this. So they are like, wow, this is so great. They're like, you know, let's go get some cows and some garlands and let's sacrifice to them. So they go get and the priest of Zeus comes and he's got the cows and they've got the garlands on. And they're like, you know, about to slaughter them in, in honor of Zeus and Hermes. And the thing is, they've been speaking in their own language. It's, I don't know, like whatever language you speak in Lystra. And um, and so Paul and Barnabas, they're, they're not, they don't really know what's going on, but like, so these cows are here or whatever. And I like imagine, you know, like they get the knife out and they're about to like go like this. And then, you know, at that point, Paul and, and Barnabas, you know, rush out and they're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, no, no, no. And they, they rip their clothes, um, you know, I think trying to, you know, get attention and what, you know, what blasphemy this would be, you know, for a Jewish person, you know, to be thought of as, as God in this way. So, you know, they tell them, no, 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 you know, don't do this. Okay, but what I was struck by is what Paul, what he says to them as he rushes out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We are mortals just like you. We are mortals just like you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God. So I think I'll just, I'll just throw out some different places I was thinking about taking this, and I'd just be curious, you know, what in this, I guess, touches something in you or that you find interesting, because I haven't really figured out where I'm going to narrow this yet. So when I was thinking about Paul, I was th first of all, I was thinking about, like, how is this my story? How is this a story of the people that I'm preaching to? So um, as I was thinking about, well, how is this my story? I said, well, what, you know, if I put myself in Paul's place, 
um i wonder if i would feel kind of torn so would there be a part of me that would be like wow like they think i'm a god and like you know they're gonna sacrifice a cow to me and i'm god and you know maybe one cow would be okay you know but um you know if there's a part of him i know there's a very human part of me you know and i'll just confess i'm an enneagram three so this is especially kind of taps into exactly what you're talking about you know there's a part of me that would be like wow like they think i'm a god and like you know they're gonna sacrifice a cow to me and i'm god and you know maybe one cow would be okay you know but um you know if there's a part of him i know there's a very human part of me you know and i'll just confess i'm an enneagram three so this is especially kind of taps into if you're familiar with the enneagram taps into that kind of like need for approval or affirmation that that i have to wrestle with in my spiritual journey so was there a part of him even for a second that liked it did did he like it that they thought he was a god and what did he have to you know what did he have to do to that but then there's this other part of me that um you know when he's saying you know i'm just a mortal just like you um if if also i think you know that there's a part of us that it's such a relief to be able to say maybe especially as pastors i'm just like you i'm like i'm a total screw up i'm a hot mess like i just you know all you know i i deal with all these you know foibles and and things as well um so kind of i think that dance i guess within me and maybe within all of us between kind of wanting to set ourselves apart or be better or whatever and then that other part that's just such a relief to say i'm part of the human race that's that's all i am that's all i am um but then another part i was drawn to is this part about how um he talks about you know we bring you this good news about this living god and this is the first sermon in acts that doesn't start from a place of talking about jesus out of the biblical narrative you know so this is the first time they're preaching to a pagan audience and so so paul can't say well the prophet said and this is the fulfillment of he has to start this whole new thing so what he says to them is like hey you know even you know that in in nature and the good food that god gives you and the joy in your hearts i didn't read you that part but he talks about that 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 god has been a witness to you in all these things but let me tell you even more you know that 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 god has drawn near in jesus christ and we have this we have this face of god now that that we can see and know um so i'm kind of you know thinking about that so i'm just curious was there anything either in the story or in any of that 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 you respond to that piques your interest I mean, I uh, you're such a good storyteller. <laughs> like you told that so well. Like I felt like I was there, um, and all of it. I, I that 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 instant reaction when somebody puts you in a place that uh, of worship to to both like oh maybe I'm doing something right and don't do that. Like I I um, but I think the one that drew me me personally in most right now is the I'm I'm just a human being mm-hmm. you know part of my ordination paperwork and one of the questions I talk about uh, th- this is not a job like we don't get to clock out and stop being a pastor when we um, you know go to a restaurant or whatever we do we we carry that the weight of our souls is kind of my image mm-hmm. and, and you know in my mind um so for me i think that really is the one that that drew me personally and where i am in the most um and and how it's just it can be a struggle to to say no please don't put me in that place where i'm not because i am human and i am broken and i think I need a place. I need a place to not be a pastor, you know, mm-hmm. to be able to say, "Hey, I'm broken and I'm not in a place that I can help you right now." So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I guess what that makes me think about is so Paul, you know, in admitting his his humanity, being immortal and all that, and yet in that space he could point to God. So I mean he's you know he here he is glorifying God through the saying hey it's not me it's not me get your eyes off me and see beyond me <coughs> to to God. So I guess that's kind of I guess what I'm wondering now is 
how in our very you know vulnerable authentic broken self how do we point to god point beyond ourselves to god as paul does interesting because both peter and paul right human frail flawed people and they're the big guys you know they're they're the ones of our faith yeah i mean you've got two sermons right you you can you can come back around to this one next week if you want to is a i don't think you can be a preacher if you have no ego i think i think the demands of the job are such that if you're going to open it up every week if you're going to stand out there and say here's what i believe or even more courageously thus saith the lord you're exposing yourself and, and you've got to have some some ego to be able to do that and that's the danger right that that, that ego becomes um too big too important too central and, and we and we judge ourselves by how many people are willing to sacrifice cows to us or, or whatever you know how willing they are to to see in us something that's really not there i think i think that's powerful but but so, so that's a great sermon to preachers is what I, <laughs> I think the second part though i think is is um increasingly clear that in our time and in our place we cannot count on congregations knowing their story and we certainly can't count on the casual seeker knowing the story yeah. and so much of preaching today or Christian witnessing or even evangelism today is pointing out where God is already in your midst mm. I think I think that's I think that's a powerful shift from the days when we were calling everybody back to some shared story and shared narrative. Uh, now when we address the marketplace or the, or the world outside the church and often the church itself, we're reporting God's presence as much as we are inviting them to, to share, you know, go, go back, to, to turn around to the old story you've lived. They didn't know that story. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's, I think it's powerful to just put on that lens where you where you are looking for God in places where people don't expect God to be. Yeah. Because God's all over, you know. Yeah. And, and so anyway, you've got two good sermons. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's interesting that it's not in the lectionary. Yeah. So so in yeah. this part where you're like, I didn't yeah. know this part of the story. Like like there yeah. is a part of our story that says yeah. uh, that that Paul's preached in the beginning saying in our hearts like yeah. there's yeah. God is already there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go I, I, uh, I'm preaching from the seventh chapter of Romans this week it is the uh, epistle lectionary for the week Paul's writing to a church to, to people he's never met yet um, and he's trying to build a case for the gospel and to provide some support for further work in Spain or wherever um, and so Paul, in, in this letter, is less personal through most of the letter than he is into, to the other letters, the Galatians or Ephesians, or people that he knew well, where he could just sort of talk about himself. But then he has this one little section in the seventh chapter of Romans where, where he, well, the opening line, verse 15 is, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. It's fascinating to me as I've looked through the commentaries, the big debate is um, whether this is pre, he's talking about pre-conversion Paul or post-conversion Paul. Oh. Is he talking about his life before he encountered Christ on the road to Damascus that Patty preached on last week or is he talking about his life right now as a, as a missionary, as an apostle? And and I have to admit, this may tell you more about me than it does, does Paul. I hope he's talking about his life now. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what do you think? What, what, I mean, you know the passage. Do you, do you think Paul's talking about his, his own current struggle for, for um, this war within himself between these mixed motives and pulling them in different ways? Or do you think he's saying, I used to be that way? Oh, yeah, I... Uh, I absolutely think it's it's present tense. I mean, you know, I, I find myself such, you know, a mix of contradictions and all yeah. that. It, actually, yeah. when you were doing uh, sharing that story, I thought back to uh, my son Luke when he was really little, maybe, I don't know, 
three years of age. For some reason, he loved to get an orange crayon and um, color his brother's closet door. <laughs> and, you know, this was utterly unacceptable. You know, there were all these consequences, um, you know, including he would have to clean it, we would take away the crayons, you know, all this. But it probably happened three or four times. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> He's a great kid. But anyways, I remember like sitting down with him and just being like, Luke, you know this is wrong. Why do you keep doing it? And, and he had no answer. I mean, he was really like, Mom, I don't know why. I, don't, I, I know it's wrong. I don't know why I keep doing it. And you know, I remember listening and being frustrated, but also thinking it was kind of funny. <laughs> Um, and I'm like, wow, like that's it, like that's that's the human condition, you know. Yeah. We yeah. know the good we should do, and yet we fail to do it. And yeah. thanks yeah. be to God for grace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Part, of, I mean, I'm exactly with you. I, I, I wouldn't struggle with that part. It feels like, like, um, for me, being in the church, for following Christ, for giving my life over to that. Um, so much of it is wrestling. I, I think the the you know, the expectation of I'm going to wrestle with these deep, hard um, struggles and, and my con the human condition of here's what I should do and, and here's what I do and I don't understand. Um, I think because I spent so much of my life outside of the church, and I'm not saying everybody does this outside the church, but for me, um, I don't think I wrestled with it in the same way before I had a community around me that, that kind of started pointing me in the right mm -hmm. direction and saying, it, mm -hmm. you know, here's what it looks like to live a life of love and grace, and it means, you know, being able and willing to look at your own life and seeing where that, that's not true. I don't think I had that same direction and that same um, call to struggle before my my conversion experience. Sure, sure. So yeah, I, I'm trying to come up with a, a, a metaphor, an image, a concept to describe Paul. And the word that keeps coming back to me is trapped. He finds himself mm -hmm. trapped by mixed motives, by impulses, by being pulled in different directions. And so that's one of the things I'm thinking about in the sermon is, what are those things that trap us? In, in almost every commentary I read, <clears throat> the, 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 the one image that they used was, this sounds like an AA meeting. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Paul, and I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and his freedom begins by recognizing the reality that he doesn't have control. Yeah. That, he, that he, is, he is trapped yeah. into this. And, and then the rest of this passage, it goes back and forth between, I want to do this, but I end up doing that. There's no good in me. I do the bad. And he goes all of that to the very end. And, you know, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Which is a great affirmation, but not very specific. We, we, know, we know the who, we just don't know the how. Oh. And, and I'm trying to get my mind a little bit around wh what was it in Christ Jesus that, that delivered him from that? Mm -hmm. um, what I think maybe, here's kind of where I'm leaning now, what I think maybe he's talking talk about is that in Christ Jesus he caught a glimpse of himself as he could be. Mm -hmm. He caught a glimpse of himself um, freed from these impulses and, and pushes to move away from where God wants them to be, and the strength to kind of move in that direction. But I don't know. It's it's a it's a, it's an affirmation. It's an exclamation. But there's no how to this. So you got a how for me? You, you got you got a good last story for me to get you out of? You know what? I think you're really like walking around in mystery, because I think that you know whether it's it's an addiction or, or something like that. I think that there is this mysterious moment when you like absolutely know you can't do it. And so you reach this point of surrender mm -hmm. where you're like, well, I can't, but you can. And and you mm -hmm. kind of, you know, you let go and that grace kind of swoops in in that place of openness that you've created with that with that surrender. And I 
I think it's kind of beyond words in some ways. Which makes it very hard to preach. I know. I was thinking the same thing. Oh, my gosh. That is so beautiful. I love that. How do you how do you preach that? Yeah. How do you invite people into that? I mean, you preached for a long time. How do you preach that? <laughs> I don't know. You you offer a story and hope people can find themselves in it. You know, I think it's about the best you can do. Um, but I think I think th- there's something powerful about even letting go of of the fear and the guilt of of all these mixed motives that, that somehow recognizing your brokenness and trusting God to forgive that and, and to help you move in the way God wants you to move is maybe enough or at least the first step yeah. of that. So I mean I think you know we we put so much shame around that right in yeah. our culture and I think I think it's just a necessary part of being a Christian like that's that's how we grow yeah. you know in these yeah. kind of fits and starts and these sure. feelings or whatever and so um, yeah, one day at a time, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's AA, right? I mean, I, mm-hmm. I will not drink today. I might drink tomorrow, but I will mm-hmm. drink today, they say. So there's there's something powerful about living that thing one day at a time. Yeah. So totally going off subject a little bit, but what's the difference then between AA and, and the Christian walk? <laughs> well, I mean, I there's a specificity to the, to the story that defines a Christian over the, the broader, more, more um, oh, uh, oh, a higher power kind of image. We, we identify that in a very specific way through the person of Jesus Christ that calls us to live in a certain way. But I can tell you this. My, I have a dear friend that I spent a lot of time fishing with who is a longtime member of AA. And, and the church frustrates him because the church never gets to the level of vulnerability that he just that he finds in his AA meetings, yeah. where people aren't putting on airs. There are no facades. They don't pretend to be something that they're not. They are completely open yeah. about their brokenness, yeah. and it frustrates him because in the church he doesn't experience that. Yeah. And somehow we have to look good. We have to look um, respectable in the church, and and um, and he knows they're as broken as he is. So maybe that's part of what Paul learns is that that, mm-hmm. uh, that, that complete vulnerability is, is a part of the healing. I've, I've, I mean, I this have. is a moment, like this text that you're reading and wrestling through is that moment of mm-hmm. him saying, I mm-hmm. wrestle. Mm-hmm. I don't have it right. Yeah. And that sort of brings it back to your question of is this before or after? Was he brave enough yeah. before his experience? to name those struggles. Yeah, that's a good point. Probably not. No, he had it together. <laughs> 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 I knew. Right. What was right, what was wrong. Well, that's fun. Thank you. That was very helpful. Uh-huh. Um, Patty, do you want to close us out somehow? Let's pray. Okay. Oh, God, we've been sitting on holy ground here and um, walking around in, in mystery. And God, it's been a joy to... Um, be in this space with people who may be listening online wherever they are. We're all part of the body of Christ, God, and we ask you to be working for good through all of this. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah, maybe next week. <laughs> Can I do it again?